What is up ladies and gents, this is George Bean, and today is a very special review for John Carpenter fans, including me, as it does not involve Halloween this time around. No, this time I am reviewing the 1982 masterpiece, uh, the sci-fi horror film, The Thing, of which it, Carpenter had directed and starring Kurt Russell as McCready. Upon its release on June the 25th, 1982, The Thing had surprisingly received a very negative critical reception, with many critics describing it as instant junk, a wretched mess. Even R Roger Ebert described it as a great bark bag movie, and it was proposed as the most hated film of all time. Reviews had both praised the special effects achievements and criticized their visual repulsiveness, while others focused on poor characterization. And for its box office, the film had grossed up to nineteen million dollars, uh, ni over nineteen million dollars in theaters. Ever since uh, it, but ever since it was released on home video and television, and thus over the thir the past thirty five years since its release. The Thing had received, has received a massively growing cult following amongst movie, movie buffs, having reappeared as one of the best science fiction or horror films ever made, and with many now considering it to be a, a, as Carpenter's grand masterpiece and a massive influence among many filmmakers to come. The Plot The story follows the crew of an Antarctic scientific research outpost as it ends up discovering an alien organism that had been frozen in the ice for 100,000 years. But when the alien awakens from its hibernation, the crew discovers that, that it is a parasitic life form that can assimilate and then imitate its victims, thus leaving the crew in a growing state of paranoia who is o over who is human and who is the thing which would ultimately culminate in a battle of survival between the humans and the Thing. This film was actually based on a 1938 novella by John W. Campbell called, titled Who Goes There? And it, this film is also the second, the second attempt to adapt the novella to film. The first attempt was in 1951 with the sci-fi horror B-movie uh, titled The Thing from Another World which was somewhat adapts the original novella, one huge difference being the portrayal of the titular monster, which in the 1951 film was like a vegetable-like monster. Carpenter was a fan of the 1951 film, and had even featured it in his film Halloween. There's one scene uh, where the film's title was displayed very prominently on a TV screen the main characters were watching in this film. And so, when he had heard that Universal Pictures had a, was attempting for years to develop a remake of The Thing from Another World, he had signed on to direct it, and with the help of screenwriter Bill Lancaster, had written a screenplay that was more faithful to the original Who Goes There novella. And with that said, there are a few differences between this film and the novella. Like, for instance, in the novella, the expedition crew had comprised of 37 members, but this was reduced down to 12 in the film, due to 30 th 37 being too excessive for audience to follow with each having little screen time for characterization, and the writer Lancaster had also opted to alter the story structure, cho choosing to open his, his in the middle of the action instead of using a flashback like in the novella. But one thing, interesting thing is what Carpenter had said about the various drafts that were written for the film before he became involved. He said that one draft, which was written by Logan's run writer, William F. Nolan, had went for a more invasion of the body snatchers approach, while another draft, written by Toby Hooper and Kim Hemkel, was set at least partially underwater and was scribed described as a Moby Dick-like story in which the captain did battle with a large, non-shapeshifting creature. Carpenter had described the previous traps as, quote-unquote, awful, 
as they changed the story into something it was not, and had ignored the chameleon-like aspect of the thing. And in a weird way, this film also acts like a quasi-sequel to the 1951 film, as it is revealed that the American Outpost was not the first people to have encountered the thing. It had happened before upon the Norwegian Outpost crew, who had first encountered the alien. There's a scene where McCready flies out to the Norwegian camp and discover right from the get-go that something horrifying had happened there. Horrifying had happened there. The outpost had been ravaged and nearly burnt down from a fire, and there they discover a giant block of ice with a huge hole in it, from which the the was which uh the creature had thawed and awakened from. And uh, an obvious homage to the block of ice thing in the 1951 film, and when watching the camera footage they took from the Norwegian camp, shows the Norwegians expediting the buried spaceship, and even attempting to use the, the thermite tur charges to blow it out of the ice. Also, also a, an obvious homage to the spaceship buried under the ice in the original. And here's a fun little trivia fact for all you ladies and gents. But the burnt-down Norwegian camp McCready flies to to investigate the crew's fate was actually the, the Outpost 31 set, which the film was set, filmed and set entirely at before at before they had burnt down for the film's ending, given that this film was shot out of sequence. And so they shot all the scenes at, in Outpost 31 first, before destroying it for the film's climax. And then, and then used a burnt down outpost to shoot the Norwegian camp scenes at. Interesting little trivia fact for us Carpenter fans out there. And for a big trivia fact, Carpenter had said that this film is actually a part of his unofficial Apocalypse Trilogy, a trilogy of standalone films that center on a group of people having to avert a devastating global apocalypse. The Thing is the first film, the second film would be the underrated supernatural horror film Prince of Darkness in 1987, which was about a group of scientists who discovered that an abandoned church holds a mysterious secret that could unleash an apocalyptic dev devil upon the world. And finally, the third film would be the also underrated Lovecraftian horror film In the Mouth of Madness in 1994, about an insurance investigator who discovers that a horror writer's books may herald an otherworldly terror seeking to take back the earth. So that's a, some, an, an, yet another interesting trivia fact for us Carpenter fans out there. And this is something that I should mention concerning the final ending. At the end, after blowing up the outpost to stop the thing from going into a frozen sleep to wait for a rescue team to find it. McCready, now apparently the only survivor, finally blows up the thing, or so uh, the movie claims. And, after, and while relaxing aside the, uh, by the fire caused by the outpost being blown up, Child then suddenly reappears after going missing before the final fight. So thus McCready and Childs are quickly suspicious of each other, but by that point, they are too tired and exhausted to do anything about it, and they instead decide to just relax with a bottle of booze. And based on how it ends, they may have likely eventually died of exposure and or hypothermia, frozen to death. But the ending had been through a number of changes when the script was being written. In Lancaster's original script, the ending had both McCready and Childs turn into the, into the thing, and when the spring came, they are rescued by helicopter, and they greet the, their saviors with, hey, quote, hey, which way to a hot meal, end quote. But Carpenter had thought that this ending was too shallow, and he had instead opted to end the film as it is in the final film with the survivors slowly freezing to death at, to save humanity from infection, believing this to be the ultimate heroic act. And so Lancaster wrote this ending, which eschews a Twilight Zone-like style twist toward the destruction of the monster, as he wanted to instead have an ambiguous moment between the pair, of trust and mistrust, and fear, fear and relief. 
And apparently, there have actually been a couple endings that have been filmed for this film. One the ending had McCready being found by the rescue team, and when given a blood test, is revealed to not be infected, which would have given the ending a much lesser, much more happier note. Another ending would have gone the same way it does now, but it would have then cut it to the morning after, and we then would see a dog running away, but it then stops and looks back at the now burnt down Outpost 31 before it resumes running away, possibly likely to set up a possible sequel. Now to mention, there had been talks of doing a sequel to this film. In December 1991, Dark Horse Comics had published a comic book sequel to the 1982 film titled The Thing from Another World, published, written by Chuck Ferrer and st starred McCready at, as the hero in it. Farrow was reported to have pitched his comic tale to Universal as a sequel in the early 1990s, but this had never came to fruition. As you may know, Chuck Frere would go on to uh, write the comic book that, that would eventually become the 1998 sci-fi horror film Virus, which set star Jamie Lee Curtis and Donald Sutherland. Thought you may know that, for all you fans out there. And he had also written the 1993 action film Hard Target, which was directed by John Woo and starred Jean-Claude Van Damme. But back to the sequel thing. In 1999, Carpenter had talked about doing a possible The Thing 2 based on Farrer's concept, having it set immediately after the first film, and have Kurt Russell and Keith David's characters have frostbite to hide their age. But this had ne ne also never materialized, but in 2002 would come a The Thing video game, which was structured as a standalone sequel to the 1982 film, focusing on a group of soldiers investigating the fate of Outpost 31, and discovering a conspiracy involving experimentations on the Thing organism to create a biological weapon out of it. The video game had received uh, a positive receptions from fans of the film, and had even uh, been given a seal of approval from Carpenter himself. Then in 2005, the Sci-Fi Channel had attempted to develop their own sequel as to the 1982 film, titled Return of the Thing, which was to be a four-hour, two-part miniseries set 20 years after the original film, and focusing on a group of military scientists, both Russian and American, as they struggle to contain the thing, thing organism, as it ends up spreading to a small New Mexico town and infects its residents. But of course, this had also never, never materialized as well, but you can find a script of review uh, for this miniseries on a website, uh, which uh, I, can pro uh, I will provide a link for y'all to go to uh, in the description box below the vi this video. Go check out the script review for this miniseries. You may like it. I actually read it, and it sounded pretty decent. And finally, in 2011, came a new The Thing film, this time in the form of a prequel, focusing on the Norwegian Outpost crew who had first discovered The Thing and how it ends up leading into the events of the 1982 film. This film was from the producers of the 2004 Dawn of the Dead remake, and stars Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Despite the filmmakers promising that they would be using practical effects for their film, the studio had still opted to apply CGI over the Thing effects, which became the prime criticism among fans. I had seen, seen this prequel, prequel at my local drive-in with my pops. Uh, and we both enjoyed seeing it. While it is not perfect and does not hold a candle to the 1982 film, and using CGI for the thing effects is a major complaint I also have, but I do still enjoy the prequel. I had sometimes used to watch the prequel and the 1982 film back to back in, back in the day. I could see why the prequel didn't do well at the box office, and that was mostly because of brand confusion based on improper marketing. 
the marketing had led many to presume that it would be a remake of the Carpenter film, especially given that the prequel had, is also titled simply The Thing, having no subtitle to differentiate it from the 1982 film. I think if the prequel did have a subtitle to it, I think it would have helped a little bit for people to understand what the film was supposed to be, and that it was not a remake. But who knows. But if you had asked me if I had ever had an idea on how I would like to see a sequel be done, in my version, I'd have it be set immediately where the Carpenter film had ended, have it be that McCready and Childs are rescued and sent to the McMurdo station, and have it be set primar entirely at the McMurdo station, where another thing outbreak ensues at. And I would also possibly have a human villain who seeks to obtain the Thing organism and turn it into a biological weapon, given that the film is set in 1982, when the Cold War was still ongoing. But that is ju probably just me. That's how I'd like to see a Thing sequel go, in my opinion. Now, as for me and my personal opinion about this film, so I... I, I haven't actually gotten to properly watch this film when I was a young kid, but I did get to watch it when my pops had videotaped it off the sci-fi channel along with the 1951 original, when I had finally gotten to watch it properly the, when I was a very young kid, but it was until I had gotten around to seeing the 2011 prequel when I had finally gotten to watch it properly. And it was then that I had a newfound appreciation for this film. And yes, as you can get, as you can guess here that I love this film. One of my all-time favorite sci-fi horror films alongside Alien that combines sci-fi and horror. What I love about this film is how, while it is very much a sci-fi monster horror film, it also feels more like a whodunit paranoid thriller, as it makes you question whom to really trust out of this entire crew. You wonder who is human and who is the thing, and thus there's this sense of paranoia that ends up growing amongst the crew. It even had one of the crew mem members as being a big red herring. Carpenter was valid in his point when he said that when he read the Who Goes There novella, he had drawn parallels between it and Agatha Christie's mystery novel, Ten Little Indians, or also titled And Then There Were None. And honestly, you could say that the thing could be described as Ten Little Indians meets Alien, in a way. As for the cast, Kurt Russell was a great choice as Mac as McCready, as as he always is in every role he's in. I like how McCready isn't seen as this sort of action hero. He's more like an everyman helicopter pilot who drinks out of boredom and plays computer chess, and is forced to have to deal with this alien organism terrorizing the outpost. He's somewhat similar to Kurt's other character Snake Plissken in Escape from New York, and maybe even his other role as Jack uh, uh, in Big Trouble in Little China, as all the characters uh, are not so heroic people who are pushed into big sit situations in the plotline. Keith David was fantastic as Childs. He plays the character as this sort of hothead. And finally, a black man that does that does not die in a horror movie. That's something I am glad to see. I enjoy Keith David in anything he's in. He was even good as uh, the holy man in Pitch Black. He would also go on to work with Carpenter again in the criminally underrated 1988 sci-fi action film They Live, which is a fucking awesome movie to watch. In that, Keith gets into a cool-ass alleyway fight with Roddy Piper. Wilford Brimley was also good as Blair, the outpost biologist. He is depicted as the one person who immediately breaks down once he figures out how the thing works, 
and what would happen if it reaches civilization and goes nuts and destables, sabotages the outpost's radio systems and helicopters. You could say that he is sort of the human villain in this film, much like uh, one character in the 1951 film, Dr. Arthur Carrington, who is also like a human villain in that film. And even so, both characters threaten the other character the other characters with a pistol. I remember Brimley in other films such as the 1985 sci-fi drama film Cocoon and the 1993 film adaptation of John Grissom's The Firm, which I had previously done a, a review for several months ago. And as for the rest of the cast, we've got Gary, the expedition commander, who is played by Donald Moffat. Next up is the physicist Nora. Norris, played by Charles Hallahan, whom I must mention had unfortunately passed away from a heart attack in 1997, much like his character does in this film. But next up is David Klenning as Palmer, the outpost's second helicopter pilot, and the blue-collar stoner. And we've also got Clark, played by Richard Mouser, who is the dog handler and is supposed to be the big red herring in the film. And Joel Polis as Fuchs, the scientist of the bunch. And then we've got Richard Dysart as Dr. Copper, the outpost's physician. And we also have Peter Maloney as Bennings, the mechanic, and also T.K. Carter as Knowles, the outpost's main cook, and the other black man as well. And finally we have Thomas Waits as Windows, the outpost's radio operator. The camaraderie among the, the outpost crew was done very well. Each has their own distinct uh, voice within this 12-man crew. A similar feat also done well in other similar films like Alien and Predator, but has been failed to be replicated in later installments of each franchise of their own. But even the 2011 thing prequel has a little bit uh, of uh, a little bit, a pretty little bit of decent camaraderie amongst the Norwegian crew in that film. But the biggest star of the film is the thing itself. Through the perfect use of practical effects, all crafted amazingly by, by the underrated special makeup effects artist Rob Bottin. His crafting the thing effects does does still stand the test of time to this day. They all look very grotesque and brutal as the human body suddenly rip themselves apart and transform into these horrible, abominable creatures. The best ones possibly has to be the ones involving uh, Norris and Palmer. Botine would also go on to do the makeup effects for the 1995 uh, David Fincher film Seven, but that sadly resorted to working on Adam Sandler comedies, with his last film, based on what I heard, his last film being the 2002 uh, Sandler film Mr. Deeds, before he decided to retire and go hermit. It's sad to see a great man go out with, with a whimper like that. But his effects for this film is still spectacular to watch. It's done amazingly. And it's just bright. And apparently, the light effects maestro, Stan Winston, had apparently helped out in the practical effects for the dog theme scene. And this was when he was still relatively unknown before he'd strike gold with the Terminator. One thing I like is how it explains the threat of what would happen if the Thing manages to reach civilization. When Blair analyzes the Thing's biology, he calculates that if it reaches civilization, the entire world population would be infected within 27,000 hours from first contact. According to many, 20, 27,000 hours actually means three years. So that means that it would only take three years for the thing to infect the entire world. And it's I wouldn't blame him blame Blair I wouldn't blame Blair to 
break that have a breakdown when real knowing this fact. Three years, damn. What I like about this film is how many people called this film a remake of the 1951 film, but I wouldn't exactly call it a remake. It is more like a re a readaptation of the original Who Goes There novella. Because rather than simply outright remake that film beat for beat, it instead takes prime inspiration from the original novella. I believe it was a wise choice to take more cues from the novella, because it was so rich with the monster elements that the 1951 film did not completely take from, especially in terms of what the monster is and how it works. But what about... What I believe makes this film superior to its novella is how it begins in media res, using the mystery to reveal that another human outpost have, had encountered the thing before, after having found it in the ice and bringing it to their face. And so Outpost 31 was not the first people to have encountered the thing. After attacking the, the Norwegian camp, the thing, in the form of a dog, Runs across the ice and finding Outpost 31, all the while being chased by two Norwegians in a helicopter who are trying to shoot and kill it. And so when they run into the Outpost 31 crew, the latter crew are confused as to why these two Norwegians are trying to kill this dog, especially when one of them speaks to him, them in Norwegian. But even we are never revealed through subtitles what this guy had said. But according to what translators say, what the Norwegian had said was, quote, Get away from it. It is not a dog. It is a thing. Get away, you idiots. End quote. But after that, the Norwegian then continues shooting, hitting Benin's in the leg before the Norwegian shooter is then shot dead by Gary. And so while trying to figure out what had actually happened to the Norwegian crew, they keep the dog and put him in the kettle with the other dogs. And it's only then does the dog reveal itself to be a thing to the crew, thus revealing to them what they may be dealing with. But I will say, that scene when the dog turns into the thing, it really pains me to watch those other husky dogs be attacked, harmed, and even killed in that scene. Because as a kid, I had used to own a pet husky dog who was similar to the dogs in this film. So it is... It is a bit too much for me to watch such a dog to be harmed in such a way like that. But yes, I do love how the first act uses mystery to reveal another outpost having encountered the thing before Outpost 31 does. The mystery in this film works effectively and actually is also reminiscent of a similar thing done in Alien which Net filmed and the Stromo crew discover a long derelict alien spaceship with a long dead alien captain and a sh storage hole full of alien eggs, which then puts in motion the plot of that film. But so in, in that film, it's the slowly revealed through mystery that the derelict alien ship had also fallen victim to the alien before the Nostromo crew ever would. But if there was just one minor complaint I'd had for this film is in its opening prologue, which shows the alien spaceship flying through space towards Earth, and it enters the Earth's atmosphere. I will say, I love that shot, but I, lo I love how the s spaceship looks and how it flies towards Earth, but I believe that if this scene had been cut out of the film, I think the reveal of there being an alien life form in this film would have been a huge surprise for audiences. It's like the same problem I have with Predator, which also had a similar opening, opening scene where an alien spaceship flies towards Earth and it jettisons a small plot, pod out, out, which then enters Earth's atmosphere. I think if it wasn't for that scene, the reveal of the Predator probably would have been all the more surprising to audiences. Probably the very best scene in this film probably has to be the blood test scene, when McCready forces everyone at gunpoint to be tied down to the ch to chair to the couch and have their bloods be tested to find out who is human 
and who is the thing, by sticking a hot needle onto a small vat of blood, concluding that given that any and all forms of the thing, even down to a small blood cell, can live independently of each other, and believes that it will react violently when in contact with a hot needle. He does find most of the crew, even including Clark, to be human, and sus suspects Gary of being a thing. But just as he tests Palmer's blood with the needle, Palmer's blood jumps, thus revealing Palmer to be a thing, and it leads to that great scene where the tied down Palmer then transformed into, into the thing, in which his head tears itself apart to form into a monstrous mouth as it also attacks windows as well, while McCready is having trouble trying to ignite the flamethrower, until he finally does and lights up the Palmer thing on fire. The on-fire Palmer thing then plows through a wall to outside, yet another homage to the 1951 film, and falls down before McCready then blows it up with a stick of dynamite. It is such a great scene, the tension building up each time someone's blood is tested, and even when one of them is revealed to be a thing, it is still a jump-scaring surprise. It's never expected, expected, because you suspect somebody else of being a thing, and then BOOM! The thing reveals itself to be somebody else. I love how, I love how Palmer, as Palmer is turning into the thing, the others who are tied up next to him on the couch, Gary and Childs, are just freaking the fuck out, and I wouldn't fucking blame them to have to be tied up right next to this guy who's suddenly turning into this freakish monster. I'd be freaking out too. And the cinematography by Dean Cundy was fantastically done well in how it managed to capture that sense of isolation and paranoia in this outpost in the deserted middle of Antarctica. Dean Cundy had collaborated with Carpenter since Halloween in 1978, up until Big Trouble in Little China in 1985. But he is also well known as the cinematographer on such films as Back to the Future, Hook, Jurassic Park, and Apollo 13. But this is also something that I had just learned about that I, recently that has deeply shocked me now. But it turns out that he was that he had directed Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves in 1997. It's shocking that he had directed that. But it is also truly sad to me that when you see his filmography now, he was also cinematographer on that shitty Adam Sandler movie, Jack and Jill. It's like, what happened to you, Dean? But still, his early work is still his best out of his 40-year career as a cinematographer. And his work on The Thing, as well as those on Halloween and Escape from New York, are some of his best collaborations with Carpenter. And the music score was composed, which was composed by the legendary Ennio Morricone, which is a rare instance uh, where Carpenter does not score his own one of his own films. Morricone was more notable for scoring Western Western films including Sergei Leone's Dollars Trilogy, which starred Clint Eastwood as the man with no name. But with this film, Morricone goes for a more suspenseful and claustrophobic tone, and the best piece in the score is the dun-dun, dun-dun, dun-dun piece, which is played a few times throughout the film, especially during the end credits. But apparently this film's score was nominated a Razzie Award for Worst Musical Score, which is such other bullshit right there, as this sco score is perfect and just goes to show how people can sometimes be wrong about a movie every now and then. Like what happened with Blade Runner, which was also released in 1982 and received a mixed negative reception but has gone has now gained a huge cult following in the past 35 years, to the, to the point where it actually now has a sequel, which was released la just last year. 
What is an interesting little trivia tidbit is that some of Morricone's unused pieces for the, the Thing score would go on to be used in Quentin Tarantino's 2015 Western film The Hateful Eight, of which Kurt Russell would also star in. Hateful Eight was also actually the first high-profile Hollywood film that Morricone had ever written a complete score for in like 15 years since Mission to Mars in 2000. And to mention, what I do is, I usually love to watch both Alien and The Thing as like a sort of sci-fi monster double feature, as both films are sort of similar to each other. A blue-collar crew trapped in a small claustrophobic location with a hostile virus-like alien organism tr that is trying to kill them. In Alien, it is set on a spaceship while in The Thing, it is set in an Antarctic outpost. So yeah, the I'd recommend watching Alien and The Thing back to back one night. And I believe that you could maybe even watch the two films along with the 1989 underwater sci-fi horror film Leviathan, which starred Robocop himself, Peter Weller, which is extremely s similar to Alien and The Thing, except it happens to be set in an underwater facility. So yeah, I'd recommend y'all to consider possibly doing that on one night when you get a chance. But to say, it is a crying shame that this film had gotten a negative reception when it was released in theaters. Many factors have been cited for its reception and box office. One being that audiences had rejected it for its nihilistic, depressing viewpoint at a time when the U.S. was in the midst of a recession. Another more major factor was that it was facing big competition in the summertime. It was released just two weeks after the release of the more critically and commercially successful film E.T. The Extraterrestrial which was a more family-friendly film, offering a more optimistic take on alien visitation. This film was also released on the same day as Blade Runner, and other people blame an oversaturation of science fiction and fantasy films released that year as well, including Conan the Barbarian, Poltergeist, The Road Warrior, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and Tron. As I am a loving fan of Carpenter's work, it really saddens me to know that this film's negative perceptions had hit Carpenter very hard in the heart. It had left him depressed. And as a result, his next film, the 1983 film adaptation of Stephen King's Christine, was made to be less gruesome. And he had also decided to make his next film, the 1984 sci-fi film Starman, to be more light-hearted, in an attempt to prove, in an attempt to prove that he could do more than just bloody horror films, and also apparently, the thing's failure had actually cost him the job of directing the 1984 film adaptation of Stephen King's Firestarter, and not only that, but that had also it had also cost him a multi-film contract with Universal, despite gaining that contract based on his previous success. And while he had continued making films after The Thing, he had apparently lost confidence and had not openly talked about The Thing's failure until a 1985 interview with Starlog, where he said that he was called, a, quote, a, por a pornographer of violence. And after experiencing a number of flops around the time of the millennium, such as Vampires in 1998 and Ghosts of Mars in 2001, it had seemed that Carpenter had lost his love of making movies and had decided to give up on directing any more films, uh, instead focusing more on his uh, musical career up until 2010 when he returned to the director's seat for the psychological horror film The Ward, which had also not received a good reception as well, unfortunately. But uh, now it seems that he is 
back into Hollywood filmmaking as he is now executive producing uh, the new Hollywood the ho the new Halloween film, which is slated to be released uh, this month on October nineteenth. But it does still breaks my heart that this film did not get the credit that it truly deserved. But I do sincerely hope that Carpenter is aware that this film has now gained a strong cult fan following in the past 35 years afterwards. But still, I am glad to see that this film had gained a huge fan following, and I do, do sincerely love this movie. Everything about it is perfect. The alien, the cast, the perform and performances by them, the alien practical effects by Rob Bottin, the whodunit style paranoia, tension and atmosphere, the claustrophobic outpost setting, the haunting music score by Ennio Morricone, and most of all, Carpenter's direction. So overall, overall, I will happily give The Thing a rating of 9.5 stars out of 10, because it is a very effective sci-fi monster paranoid thriller with enough paranoia and tension to keep you on the edge throughout, with interesting characters led by a great cast to enjoy watching and how they in, and how they deal with the thing situation. The music is very effective in making you goosebumpsy, and this is definitely John Carpenter at his very best. So thank you for, for watching, ladies and gents, and for my next video, I will be reviewing John Carpenter's Halloween. So now you can expect a video published by Monday. So thanks for watching, ladies and gents, and until then, I will see you all next time. Peace!